Well, first, let's go over the importance of ROB. Now actually, on balance, ROB's agreement with the phrase is actually pretty mutually beneficial. Walder obviously gets two stark intermarriages, two boys warded in the north, and another who is getting a pretty big honor in squiring for Rob. But Rob also benefits from it as well. For one, this helps further establish respect for him within his host of grown men he's leading, as he shows a willingness to do anything for his cause, even blindly signing on to a marriage pact, and shows himself to be a responsible young man capable of being a lord. It's stuff like this that is why the northern lords named Rob King when he was still technically young enough to have a regent. And, this also plays a role in why the river lords declared for Rob as well, as in addition to being half Tully already, he's now also betrothed to a fray. Hey guys, welcome to my channel, please don't forget to like and subscribe and also click on the notification bell to remain updated. That's before considering the fact that a fray would be a pretty solid match for Rob anyways just in general, given the freys are the second most powerful house in the Riverlands whose lands are close to the north. Add in the fact that Big and Little Walder are solid choices for wards, one is half Derry, the other half Blackwood, and having a squire isn't the worst idea either. The only issue is with the Elmer Arya match, which Arya is as Rob admits probably not going to be too happy about it. Luckily, Elmar is with Roos as a squire, which leaves a possibility of him dying, and from a political standpoint, you can award Arya and Elmar lands later on and perhaps start a cadet branch for both sides. Now the phrase are important for a few reasons. They are easily the most useful house in Rob's whole plan, giving him men to cover for the loss that comes with splitting his host, securing the twins' loyalty to make sure they have a key holding to retreat to and ensuring they don't have to deal with the frays taking them from the rear, and making sure word of Rob's tactics don't get leaked, while giving Rob pretty much the only place he could cross. So now we've established the usefulness of the frays, let's address the second part which is about the Tullus and the River Lords. Well, there's a few things to remember at this time. At this point, Edmure is a prisoner of the Lannisters, and Riverrun is under siege. The Lannister host had beaten Edmure before Walder could finish assembling his host, and now Walder is pretty badly outnumbered whatever he does, as he has 4k men, add in 1k from the Malisters, and maybe 2 to 3k scattered forces, and you're still well short of the 35k Lannister men in the Riverlands. So Walder's neutrality makes sense, especially since he also technically swore an oath to the throne, and by siding with the Tullus, he would technically be a rebel which gives him an out. What about the price? Well, this is Walder being opportunistic. By siding with Rob, he's taking a pretty big risk, one that puts his family in quite a lot of danger. And given the fact that a rift has emerged in recent years between him and Hoster, this serves to repair those relations. And Walder doesn't technically owe Rob anything at this point. Rob isn't his lord, Hoster is. Rob, Caitlin, and Brynden may be Tullus, but that doesn't give them legal authority over him. Because the nature of the feudal system is that loyalties are often tenuous, and based on what someone thinks you can do for them. It's pointed out, both in the books and the show, that Walder Frey is supposed to be subordinate to House Tully, and so they should simply be able to issue a command, but the reality isn't nearly so simple. From a legal perspective, the crown is supreme and the Tullys are in open rebellion against them. Hence, Walder Frey can easily justify aligning his loyalty with the crown and deciding that the orders given by his liege lord are illegal. Or he could decide that Joffrey's claim to the throne is illegitimate, and that his oaths to House Tully are therefore still in effect. How he decides will determine which of these contradictory instructions he's going to follow. That, however, is all cover. In reality, it's a question of who has the power to enforce their edicts. In theory, he owes loyalty to House Tully. In reality, he doesn't care for House Tully all that much, and they're not in a position, at that moment, to force him to obey their commands. Accordingly, he's pretty much safe if he just holds them off and waits for the Lannisters to arrive and make short work of them. 
Joffrey would make some other house lords of the Riverlands, and he'd face no retribution. In simple terms, since Walder Frey felt no loyalty to them, and they couldn't threaten him, all they had left was to bribe him. Sweeten the deal enough that it's in his best interests for the rebels to win the war instead of the Lannisters, and he suddenly realizes that Joffrey isn't the true king after all. Making one of his offspring the next Lord of Winterfell is a sweet enough prize to do that. Everyone follows the law. If you do not follow the law, society itself will mobilize to punish you, this is why prosecutions are brought in the name of the people, or the state, or the crown, etc., rather than in the name of any one person. Walder Frey, on the other hand. Not so much. He grew up in a world governed by the rule of force. The king is the most powerful, if you mess with him, he will take his personal armies and kill you. He is graciously using that power to make sure that nobody makes trouble, because he'll kill them if they do. This is the king's peace that medieval justice systems speak of. The king delegates power down to vassals who are each very powerful, but each one is only a fraction as powerful as the king. In Westeros, these are the lords paramount. Thanks for watching. Please don't forget to like this video and drop comments. And most importantly, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss anything.